Hello everyone, welcome back to AS and A Level Biology with Dr. Demi. I am Dr. Demi and in today's video I will be concluding chapter 17 of the AS and A Level Biology syllabus, focusing specifically on evolution. If you are currently preparing for the exams that will be starting for biology on the 5th of May, that's with paper 4, I would ask that you please keep an eye on the um, playlist for solutions to past questions because I will upload their uh, past questions from paper from 2019 for paper four and just sort of discuss some of the solutions. They will be very long videos, but I promise you they will be totally worth it. So please keep an eye out for that so that you don't miss out. Um, so let's look into evolution. This will be the last chapter for 17. And as much as possible, I will try to um, do chapter 18, um, but we'll see if there is room for that as you start to prepare for the exams, because I really believe that it might be more important to focus on the examination past questions um, rather than just filling you up with content. Okay, so we know about the theory of evolution, or I hope that you do, and the theory of evolution was put forward by Charles Darwin and Alfred Wallace, and this theory was based on three um, observations. You've probably heard of evolution a lot, and the observations that these two scientists based their theory, um, the observations they based their theory on was that offspring are always more than the number required to replace their parents. So think about the fact that if you are observing animals in the wild, for example, you would find that sometimes it's, it's usually just two parents, but they might have six offspring. Um, so with dogs, for example, they give birth to many puppies at once. Natural populations tend to remain stable over time, resulting in competition for survival. And that is something you can easily relate to the way we exist in the world today, that there is a lot of competition for space. We also have competition for food, for resources, uh, because we consider, because we basically live in overpopulated areas. Um, there is variation among individuals of a given species and only the best adapted variants will survive. Um, and what this simply means is that those will have variation in their favor, which is what we spoke about earlier when we were discussing rabbits, for example, that if a brown rabbit is in the woods, then it is better adapted to survive. And as a result of that, it is able to pass its alleles to the next generation. And this is what is often called survival of the fittest. So the fittest in this situation is the one that has a variation or a variant allele that enables it to survive within the environment. Now, the thing with um, the theory of evolution is that it tells how populations survive over time and perhaps how they even evolve into different kinds of um, how they survive over time or how they evolve basically into different kinds of populations. But it doesn't tell us how new species are made and that is a process called speciation. So the first things first, before we start to discuss speciation, which is basically referring to the development of new species, we need to first define what a species is. And you might think, oh, well, species is very direct. It's just a matter of saying they are organisms that look similar um, and behave similarly, and you'd be correct. Um, so just to put it in a more biological way, um, a species is a group of organisms that have similar morphological, physiological, biochemical, and behavioral features and are able to interbreed successfully to produce fertile offspring. This is really important because if you miss this out in the definition for species, you might only get one mark. It's also important to mention that they are reproductively isolated from other species. Reproductive isolation simply means that they are unable to reproduce with other um, species or with organisms from other species. Just highlighting what the different um, features mean in terms of morphological features we're looking at features where the organisms look alike so for example lions look alike it's hard to find a lion that looks like a dog or a lion that looks like a chicken uh, because they have to look alike that is how you're able to tell that they're from the same species they also have physiological features that are similar so the way their bodies work is similar for example in cows they all have a four compartment stomach and that is one of the features that sort of unites them as similar species biochemical features such as the dna the sequence of amino acids these are all the things that make them similar and can then be used to refer to them as speciation um, a similar species, rather. Ideally, if two organisms belong to the same species, you can test them by breeding them together 
to see if they produce fertile offspring. Something that's also interesting is that we can actually reproductively isolate organisms from each other to ensure that they don't breed together um, so they are unable to make fertile offspring. And I think later on in this video, I allude to how scientists are able to do that. But let's zoom in on speciation. So you will learn um, from here that there are two types of speciation that are key, allopatric speciation and sympatric speciation. Allopatric speciation refers to geographical isolation, basically saying that there is a way where geography can cause the separation of species. And by causing this separation of species, it would then cause the species to evolve differently into two different types of species. So if you look at the image I've put here, I'm just going to use my red pen. Um, this here, we can assume, used to be the same species um, of animals. But for some reason, a river started to flow through the gorge and as a result of that, resulted in them being separated from each other. Now, let's assume that they are unable to cross the river. That then would result in them evolving differently from the species on the left. So this would be the left and this would be the right. And as you can see here, the ones on the right are darker in color, while the ones on the left seem to be lighter in color. What this means also is that because of this barrier, those that are on the right and are unable to cross to the left will have to mate with each other. And that then causes inbreeding within the population and also causes certain kinds of selection pressures to act on the population. So say, for example, over here, um, we have perhaps a shortage of water. There might be an evolution of, a, of an allele that enables them to survive with less water compared to the ones on the left, which might, who might have an abundance of water. And so as a result of this, what allopatric speciation does is that over the years, the two populations will evolve very differently from each other and may eventually be unable to mix. A way I also um, explain this to my students is I say, um, let's say, for example, I come to the classroom and I take six students and I decide to take them to a deserted island. And when they get to this island, it's just the six of them. And so as a result of that, after a while, they start to mate with each other uh, because it's just them on the island. But beyond that, what will also happen is that perhaps their diet would change uh, because they're on an island and they have access to maybe more fish than they do to meat. And so they might eat more fish in their diet. They might eat more fruits and vegetables. And if for some reason I tried to bring them back um, to the school and say, OK, so maybe after a decade, I bring them back to the school in a bid to get them to mix with their previous colleagues, what would become very obvious is that, first of all, they would have evolved new ways of living. Um, so, for example, their mating calls might be different from the ones they'd find in the school. The things that they eat, obviously, would be very different from the people who stayed back at school and all of those kinds of things. That then results in them being reproductively isolated from each other through geographical isolation. And as a result of that, they evolve differently into two new species. And this is what we call allopatric speciation. So always bear in mind that allopatric speciation refers to geographical isolation. We also have what we call sympatric speciation. And sympatric speciation simply means that you don't need a geographical barrier for new species to occur. Sometimes they occur within the populations where they already exist. So think about it this way. If you have rabbits, um, for example, and with these rabbits you have um, what's it called? You have a selection pressure. So if you look here, for example, we can say these are like, let's assume these are white rabbits. I know that they look more like mice. Um, but you have a selection pressure whereby the predators are sort of evolving and um, they're sort of pursuing the white rabbits and they're able to see them clearly. You'd find that there might be the development of a new allele that helps to camouflage certain groups of rabbits. And so that new allele might make brown rabbits, which then results in them being uh, more camouflaged and more likely to survive. Um, so you can also have sympatric speciation as a result of an ecological isolation. So if you look here, for example, there were no trees at the beginning, but when you get here, you start to see that trees have started growing. And because of the colors of the trees, the rabbits might realize, or the DNA or the body basically, might realize that the rabbits are more likely to survive if they're of a brown color because they can hide between the trees. And as a result of that, there is genetic divergence because the DNA mutates um, and brings about a new allele 
and that results in reproductive isolation because the white rabbits might then choose to mate only with each other as opposed to mating with the brown rabbits. In some cases where they do mate with the brown rabbits, they might make a new species of organisms and that basically just leads to um, sympatric speciation. Now, sympatric speciation might also occur through what we call polyploidy. And polyploidy is a condition where organisms have more than two sets of chromosomes due to errors during meiosis. Now, remember that meiosis is called a reduction division. And the reason, the reason it's called that is that at the end of meiosis, the chromosome number in the, in, the gamete, in the gamete cell is halved. So if, for example, in the human cell, we start with 46 chromosomes, at the end of meiosis, we will only have 23 chromosomes inside the gamete cell. And as a result of this, when that gamete cell sort of fuses with another gamete cell that's also 23, it reproduces an organism that has 46. In polyploidy, there's an error in meiosis. And because of this error, the organisms do not have their chromosome number. And as a result of that, organisms then end up having more than the chromosome number that they need. And such organisms end up being sterile, which means that they are unable to reproduce. It's very important to highlight that this happens mostly in plants, but you might also find situations in humans whereby people have an extra chromosome that then results in debilitating medical conditions or might just make their gender arbitrary or their sex arbitrary um, in this case. Um, so let's think of the different types of polyploids. You can have what we call a tetraploid. And as you may know, tetra means four. So a tetraploid is an organism that has four sets of chromosomes. And if it undergoes proper meiosis and it splits, it reduces its chromosome number. Its chromosome number will be diploid. Normally, an organism should be diploid, so already that is creating a problem. Because if this fuses with a normal gamete, which is haploid, they would make a triploid organism. Triploid meaning an organism with three sets of chromosomes. And a triploid would be sterile, even though it might grow normally. A triploid organism is unable to produce gametes because it cannot split three sets of chromosomes evenly. And as a result of this, a triploid is always going to be sterile. The tetraploid and the diploid from which it was produced are also organisms of the same species, but of different species rather. So what this means is that if we have a tetraploid organism, that's one that has four sets of chromosomes, and it makes a diploid gamete, and also in that, in, by making this diploid gamete, the diploid gamete fuses with a haploid gamete, that would make a triploid. So always remember if you're thinking about gamete number, I'm just going to write it here, N is for haploid, 2n is for diploid, um, 3n is for triploid, and 4n is for tetraploid. Um, so all of these organisms here would be different species. A tetraploid, if it undergoes meiosis normally, would make gamete cells of 2n. Okay, If that 2n mixes with the normal haploid organism, they would make 3n. The 3N organism would be a different, would be considered a different species from the 4N because the 3N organisms cannot make gametes simply because it's unable to evenly split um, the number of chromosomes. Um, so that's just something to bear in mind. So since we've spoken about um, allopatric speciation, which is a result of geographic isolation, and we've spoken about sympatric speciation, which is a result of um, speciation that just happens without a geographic barrier and often just results in different species or different alleles evolving within a population, we can also talk about reproductive isolation and how this might prevent um, the formation of certain kinds of new species. So you can have two types of reproductive isolation. You can have prezygotic isolation and you can have postzygotic isolation. Prezygotic isolation simply means that it is a form of isolation whereby the individuals don't even come to the point where their gametes are able to fuse to form a, um, to form a zygote. Um, so it can be a result of individuals not recognizing each other as potential mates or responding to mating behavior. So again, going back to the example of my students, if I were to take six of them to an island, they would develop different mating rituals and different, different ways of even sort of signaling to each other that they would like to mate. And so if they were to come back to the school and they had to mix with the population, there would be some kind of prezygotic isolation that happens because the students at the school would also have a different way of mating or even different ways of signaling that they want to mate. And as a result of that, they don't recognize each other as potential 
potential mates and so they don't even come to the point of their gametes fusing to form a zygote. Um, individuals being physically unable to mate particularly animals um, simply because um, their genitals might just not be adapted to each other and as a result of that they are unable to mate. In plants you can have the incompatibility of pollen and stigma and sometimes you can also have the inability of a male gamete to fuse with a female gamete. You can also have postzygotic isolation as a form of reproductive isolation. And postzygotic isolation is basically the isolation that forms that result after a gamete or a zygote um, rather has been formed. So in this case, you can have um, cell division and the zygote just not working out. And so even though the gametes have come together, the animals have mated with each other, they just don't make, um, the zygote just doesn't divide and grow. Um, you can also have non-viable offspring where the offspring die shortly after they are born um, because they are not adapted to live in the environment in which they're in. So if we, for example, were to say that a pig could mate with an eagle, um, which is sort of what you can see here on this beautiful image I got from study.com. Um, if a pig were to mate with an eagle, that might seem like a very interesting um, thing to carry out, but you'd find that if the offspring were to be born, it might not be able to survive simply because it is not well adapted or it doesn't have the complete set of genes that it needs to survive as one particular species. Um, you can also have viable but sterile offspring, especially in the case of a triploid. So if you were to have a tetraploid gamete, which would then be 2N, fusing with a haploid, then that would, uh, um, a diploid gamete rather fusing with a haploid, you would then make a triploid. And in this case, the triploid would be sterile because it can't make gametes. And as a result of that, it can't reproduce. And so these are the ways that we can have reproductive isolation. And in some cases, scientists are also able to use this to sort of determine if organisms um, are able to mate with each other or if they're able to make viable offspring. Something else to also note as we come to the end of this chapter is that we can compare species and sometimes you can check the similarities of species by comparing the amino acid sequences of certain proteins as well as the nucleotide sequences of their mitochondrial DNA. So in this case where you compare amino acid sequences, um, if you have more difference in the amino acid sequence, then you can tell um, that, the, that the organisms are really different from each other. However, if you have more similarities, then you can tell that they're really similar to each other. An example of this is when we test um, cytochrome C um, in, the, in the humans, rats and mice. And what you find is that rats and mice will have identical sequences for cytochrome C. Cytochrome C is a protein and um, humans have very different um, sequences from rats and mice. And as a result of that, you can find that the rats and mice are closely related while humans are distantly related to them. The last thing to bear in mind is that you can also compare mitochondrial DNA sequences to determine if organisms are similar to each other. And something I always bring to light here is the story of mitochondrial Eve, or the, should I say, the issue of mitochondrial Eve, rather. And what it shows is this woman who lived in East Africa over 180,000 years ago. And um, she has, and basically what it has been found is that her mitochondrial DNA has been passed on from every generation um, to generation. And it sort of indicates that all humans came from this woman. And it's possible then in this case that um, all all human, all human came, all human beings rather came from Africa. So every person most likely came from this um, population, but perhaps due to pressures of allopatric speciation or even sympatric speciation, we have sort of evolved different traits, but not necessarily into different species, because I still believe that the human species is still the same. Um, so yeah, it is also important to know that the mitochondrial DNA comes from the mother and not from the father. So you're always able to trace generations and populations back to their mothers, as opposed to being able to trace them back to their fathers. And in this case, we can trace all human population on earth, be they white, Asian, um, Caucasian, um, African, you can trace them to this woman who was in East Africa. 180,000 years ago. That is going to be the end of chapter 17 and I hope that you have found this video helpful. I know it might feel a little bit rushed uh, but I'm just trying as much as possible to make room to record a past question paper for you. Please um, let me know if you have any questions just post them in the in the comments and I'm sure someone from the learning community will get back to you. Thank you so much for watching. Until the next video, have a good time.